Welcome everybody. Um, just bear with us for a moment here. Uh, I am going to go over a few things while we uh, wait for everybody to log in. Uh, for those of you who attend our webinars regularly, as always, uh, thank you for your patience while we go over these notes that you can probably recite yourself. Um, this is a Zoom webinar. It's not a Zoom meeting. So if you are new to this uh, program, we can't actually see you or hear you. So during the class, uh, if you have questions, you'll click on that Q&A box on your Zoom menu and you'll type those questions in. Peg will be taking questions later in the class. Um, so I'll be giving those to her. If you have any technical issues during the class, feel free to send me a chat. Um, you can also type it into the Q&A box, that's fine. Uh, we are recording today's class. We will send out a link to the recording following the class um, along with a coupon. So check out for those uh, follow-up emails coming tomorrow. Today we have Peg with us, uh, who is wonderful as always. She's gonna be covering summer container gardens, uh, which I'm greatly looking forward to. So this is always a fun one, lots and lots of plants to cover. Um, Peg has been doing classes with us for many years. She really needs no introduction. I know for many of you, um, she was a member of our gardening advisor television program for a while teaches seminars and works primarily at our Fair Oaks location. Uh, so Peg, I'm gonna go ahead and let you dive into some of these container gardens and plants that I see behind you. And thank you, Sally. And good afternoon to all of you. And thank you so much for, for joining in this program. Today, we're going to be talking about all of the summer hardy types of annuals that we'll all be planting very soon. We've got a little bit of a cool spell right now, but as soon as these couple of days are passed, I will certainly be working on uh, the transition from the spring annuals into the summer annuals. And a lot of this is really going to concentrate on attracting birds, bees, and butterflies. Whether you have a balcony, a small townhouse garden, uh, or a large property. We always want to think about the birds, bees, and butterflies. And uh, if we can bring up the first uh, picture, this is one that I'm particularly fond of, the hummingbirds. And uh, one of my customers a couple of days ago said she's already getting them in her garden. And oftentimes I will first see them when my azaleas come into bloom and they are in bloom right now. But I am going to definitely concentrate the first few pictures on how much I enjoy watching these hummingbirds from my front porch viewing the large number of containers that are above my retaining wall where I can see them come and feed. So let's come back to me, honey. I have a little bit of an explanation. Uh, hopefully it's not terribly obvious. It certainly could have been worse, but um, I, I really had a, a little bit of a fight on a Sunday evening. I quickly went out into the garden to water some containers that I realized were dry and I had a little fight with the hose. And I, I, I would say that I lost, but maybe I didn't. I did fall and I did hit my cheekbone and it was quite swollen, but it has gone down some now. But I, I'm mentioning this largely because you need to be a little cautious. Normally, I am very cautious because falling is not something I want to do. So little explanation there. Now, before we get into the rest of these pictures, tis the season to think about the hat. I'm getting prepared to go out into the garden. We just got in a new shipment of the Fox Gloves, which as far as I'm concerned, is the ultimate in gardening gloves. You see how that fits so snugly? I can feel everything that I'm doing. It's not like some of the gloves that are rather bulky. And so for me, this Fox glove is worth the investment. And even for you gentlemen out there, 
uh, they, they come in large sizes, you might like it too. Now, if I am working with something that's really wet, I will, I have on hand a, a package of the throwaway gloves and I'll just pull that on over while I'm working with the wet. But these are fantastic. They last for a long time and they are washable. Of course, I always am, am have my basket with all my favorite tools. You know, we're talking about um, containers. I, we just got these in and I'm so pleased because they're nice and deep. And it's the wonderful shovel that I use to fill my containers with. And so we now have these in stock. And of course, as you know, I'm always promoting made in the USA, the Wilcox uh, trowels. They're stainless steel. You'll have them forever and uh, put them in your will if you want to. Uh, I have to have those. And of course, my Joyce chins, which I use for deadheading and heaven knows how many other projects, okay? So let's go quickly because I've got a lot of territory to cover. And let's take a look at what that hummingbird enjoys and what I can view from my front porch in the early morning, in the evening when I'm sitting down there, which uh, is, is a nice place to take a break, okay? There are a number of pots above a retaining wall. These are all large pots. And in those is a variety of things. The grassy looking plant is a Carex, which really has worked for me in sun or shade. There is another cascading plant there, which is uh, Sedum angelonia. I love that one. It came through the winter beautifully. So did the Carex grass. Those, those are perennials, okay? And one can include perennials in your containers if they are long blooming or as in the case of the Angelinia uh, sedum and the Carex, it's, it's a complementary plant not grown for blooms, okay? And in this is uh, also the variegated, the tall one in the center that's a golden variegation is Euphorbia, again, a perennial but it's Ascot Rainbow. And the blossoms that it throws up in the springtime are spectacular and they last for months. So you've got a lot of complementary things going on there and, and color combos and color pickups with those plants. There is also in that area, a couple of uh, evergreen conifers, there is a small uh, Hanoki cypress, uh, a couple of others that winter over and are beautiful over the winter. Now, added to that, at this time of the year, I put in a lot of salvia. Last year, I really played with a lot of the new salvia, but included in that with those are lantana, which is an incredible draw for the hummingbirds and the butterflies. There are petunias and pentas. Pentas is a wonderful one. It will need some deadheading, but it's not a lot and it will bloom. These things will bloom until frost takes them out, okay? And this one as a part of that grouping, Again, there are petunias, and there are so many out there. The, the proven winners, yes, they cost a little more, but each plant gets really big, and, and there's some beauties there. The surfinias and the supertunias do not have to be deadheaded because they are sterile. There are, however, a lot of other new and really beautiful petunias out there also. And while they may need some deadheading, they are spectacular. And some of the colors are just fantastic. Rising out of that container is another plant that's underplanted. It's called Gumfrina. 
uh, in olden days, it used to be called a bachelor's button, but it, it isn't. It's a gumfrina. And it has these beautiful little white, pink, or purple flowers. I chose the purple to do the pickup of the color of the petunia and the salvia. And a close-up of another container in that group is, again, showing off some of these salvia. And as I said, I trialed a number of them last year. I wanted to say this is Mystic Spires, but it isn't. That's in the next picture. But there are a number of salvia. Choose the colors that you like. Take a look at the tags because the height varies tremendously on these. Anywhere from two feet uh, to two and a half feet up to three plus, okay? And of course there is lantana and you choose your colors that will complement each other. Okay, now this next picture is a close up of absolutely one of my favorite salvias. And this one is Mystic, M-Y-S-T-I-C, Mystic Spires. I hope you all have your notepads and are writing down some of these names because unfortunately I did not do an outline this time. I'm sending them out peg via chat as well and then I'll proof spelling just so everybody knows and send out a final version tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I have written them down on the picture. So maybe we can send those to you also. Okay. Mystic Spire Salvia. I'm, as I said, I've got complementary plants in here for some that are growing out low. But in the back of this bed, I have got some really big salvias, which you can only get a hint of in this picture. But in the next one, I'll show you this. This is another blue. And there's a light blue and there's a deep blue in this cathedral blue salvia. And it's shown with a beautiful red salvia. So we try to keep a salvia section and you can choose from those according to the heights that you can use. And in the next picture, still another part of that large grouping is one that doesn't like the hottest afternoon sun. All of these others will take the hot afternoon sun. Or they will thrive if they get full morning sun, if they get a minimum of six hours of full sun, they will thrive, okay? And it's difficult sometimes to explain how this sun thing works. But this red one that you see here, which is an absolute favorite of the hummingbird, is Gartenmeister, G-A-R-T-E-N, M-E-I-S-T-E-R, Gartenmeister fuchsia. And it gets about two and a half feet tall and it blooms all season, deadheaded a little bit. Not a, it doesn't require a lot of deadheading, but some deadheading is necessary for it to continue to bloom until frost. It's wonderful. Paired with that is another delightful plant comes in different colors. I've chosen purple here for a color repetition. It's Angelonia. Angelonia uh, is, a, is a great plant, comes in different heights, and there's even a weeping one that's lovely. Now, I just can't get enough of that gray dichondra, D-I-C-H-O-N-D-R-A, dichondra. It flows out of these containers and is fantastic. In the very bottom of that picture, you can see a little more gray, and that's Dusty Miller. These two plants complement everything else and really show it off. And there's a color pickup when you use both of them. And of course, you're seeing petunias. Now, let's get into those really big. This is a wonderful one to plant in the ground. It's almost a see-through see plant, but not quite. So it can be planted to the middle or the back of your border. And one plant, if you've got a small area, will get over three feet tall and almost as wide. And it blooms continuously. 
a little bit of deadheading really keeps it going well. And, and it doesn't really have to be red. Um, the hummingbirds came to my purple, they came to the blue, they came to the red. They didn't really show a lot of difference in that. So absolutely delightful. Now, again, I'm trying to show you all of the plants that work in that kind of environment and have long periods of bloom and are favorites for hummingbirds, but the bees, the butterflies come to all of this also. Another Gartenmeister fuchsia, the red one. And then there's Ageratum, A-G-E-R-A-T-U-M, Ageratum. And that's a long blooming plant too, primarily that the bees and the, and the butterflies love. Again, minor deadheading on this keeps it in bloom for a long time. The uh, Dusty Miller, the gray in the background is a wonderful complement to these colors. And next to that Dusty Miller, you can just see the tippy top actually of a dwarf uh, hemlock that you can grow in a larger container, anything from 16, 18, 20 inches, all of these dwarf evergreens and they're beautiful in containers also. All right, an absolute complete favorite is Lantana. Long blooming, you do need to deadhead some of it. There are some new varieties out there now that do not have to be deadheaded because they're sterile. And incredible, incredible butterfly, but the hummingbirds love it and so do the bees. So Lantana is one that almost has to be a staple. Um, Danny, um, while we've got this, now to come back to me, come back to me, honey. And if you walk around, I would like to show them this container in the back. And while I'm at it, I'll talk a little bit about the how-to before we go any further. Okay, this this I planted up just to show you. It is a large container, and it's a teaching one also because it has the names close to the plants that are there. And, and I hope you can see this. Yes, there's some new salvia even for this year, new to me anyway. This is incredibly attractive by color. And I'm gonna have to look the name on this one again. It's called Grandstand Blue by color Salvia. Grandstand is that one. Now, we are beginning to get in. We will have a whole lot more of them. The rocking series. This is the one that'll go three feet for sure. Blooms all summer. Comes in different colors also. This is one of, and was in one of the pictures, the cathedrals. These are more in the two foot range. And then let's see what we got over here. I've forgotten what this one is. So I think it's similar to this one. It's a nice rusty color. It's called Roman Red. So this is pretty incredible. Now, while they, this, is, this is far more plants than you really want in one container. But you know, if you get started, if you want instant gratification, okay, what you can do after they've grown a little bit is with a good heavy duty knife, you can literally cut one out and put it in another container. That is the case with any of your can containers that you feel are overgrowing. But this is a large pot. It holds a lot of soil. Now, the, I was about to tell you that this uh, Roman red is fantastic, but it is also large. But if you want some color, heavier color coming out the edges, look what this tattoo papaya vinca does. Is that a nice combination? I think in terms of combining colors when you're making your plant selection. These tags that are in these containers are very helpful. They'll tell you sun or part shade. Part shade is um, anything for the ones that love animals. Anytime during the day, 
provided there's six hours of sunshine. If it tells you it's a shade plant, part shade shade, then avoid the hottest afternoon sun. And it'll take everything else, okay? Mary, can you put that one back, honey? Thank you. Fantastic. It's so nice to have a handsome young man being able to do these things. Thank you, Daddy. I'll let you go back to changing pictures over for me, okay? <coughs> now that we have, oh, I color combinations again. If we, if we do bring, if, if you can bring up the next one, Danny, since I've disturbed you from that. <laughs> Talking about color combinations, this is another very useful plant. It looks like it's the leaf of the lantana, but it isn't. It's a codia. There are some magnificent codias out there. And again, look at that tag, because a lot of them will take full sun. There are a few that don't like the hottest afternoon sun, but the rest of them will take part shade or full sun. And so the, the, uh, the choices of the coleus are incredible. And in the next slide, I pretty much have shared uh, little Clara with you. She's three and a half now and loves, absolutely loves to be in the garden. And so I've done this with my kids, I've done it with all my grandkids, and with her is my oldest granddaughter, Bridget. She's helping her dig some baby hosta to put into Clara's garden, okay? She also helped uh, Bridget, her Aunt Bridget, dig some plants to go in Bridget's garden. So, um, do encourage the young. Get them out there. Let them know about the growing of things. I'm, I'm really so pleased with Clara's perception of the garden. I noticed the other day that she wasn't sure exactly how to follow me at one point in the game because she thought she would be stepping on a plant and she didn't want to step on that plant. So I was highly impressed, okay? Let's continue with these pictures. So, okay, where, where are you going to use these? Uh, you may only have a balcony, but several nice pots on your balcony can be wonderful for you to look at, but they can also be a transitional thing for the birds, bees, and butterflies as they pass through or move around. Just be sure that when you're putting your containers on your deck or on your, well, in your case with the patio with slate, you don't have to worry about it. But if it's wooden, you want to be sure to raise those things with pot feet or with something. And in the summertime, I frequently use saucers under the bottom because it's difficult to keep things constantly moist during, uh, not constant, it doesn't have to be constant, okay? but it doesn't need dry out, okay? So can, you do not do them in the um, wintertime because it can cause your pot to crack, but do it in the summertime. Now, here again is the use of some accessories. There are so many different kinds of begonias, and this particular one doesn't like the hottest afternoon sun but it takes sun well enough that that graceful, airy euphorbia diamond frost does well with it and complements it, both in color and just in general composition. And with that, because this is uh, protected from the hottest afternoon sun in this spot, but gets full morning sun, so just about anything will thrive if it gets full morning sun. So you've got the begonia with the euphorbia. And then complementing that is the blue and or purple torinia, T-O-R-E-N-I-A, torinia. Again, needs some deadheading. The wave series don't, do not, doesn't seem to need as much deadheading as some of the others, but you do have to deadhead. Now, that, because I love blue, there's also some scavilla there that is a blue or a bluish purple. 
but I love the blue pots and there's also a, a blue um, rounded orb that is there doing a color pickup. So your container can be a big part of your design also. And I happen to be very partial to the blue. Okay. Now this is using uh, a plant that I had or more than one plant, but particularly the cascading variegated, golden variegated, is a plant that's not understood. People think of it as a potato vine. It isn't a true potato vine. It actually, <coughs> excuse me, it is a selenium and it vines up and it's lovely. And the lighter pinkish blue, uh, Whitish blue is scavola, S C A E V O L A, scavola. And then there is in there Browalia, which does really well in park shade, B R O W A L L I A, Browalia. So those are some fun things. Now, a collage of things in the next picture. This in the bottom, you can see the blue, deep blue of the Broelia. It does really well, doesn't like the hottest afternoon sun, for me anyway. There's a variegated geranium there and a variegated New Guinea impatience. New Guinea impatience, they're two types. All of them do well, all of them, in part shade. Some do better with more shade, and some do fine with afternoon sun. So be sure that you look at your tag to, to know that that plant is selected for whatever exposure you have, okay? There are various begonias in here. Um, there's a background, it has a background here and the background actually is, is planted in the ground and there's a beautiful, bleeding heart, the golden bleeding heart in that, plus some um, Hakanakaloa uh, grasses. Okay, so that's a compliment and that's on the, uh, the patio area on slate, so I don't have to worry about it. And this is that same patio taken at a different time. And I really, I try to change it up each year so that I can share with you what I am doing and I used a lot of New Guinea impatience this year. And I used some of the variegated geraniums, plus a few of the regular geraniums. They did quite well for me. They, they were not in full sun, but they did beautifully. And in the lower container, I have spider plant. If you have an old established spider plant, you can literally, with a heavy duty knife, cut it into pieces and it does incredibly well. You can also do that with your fern. You can uh, take, let's say you buy a gallon size uh, fern, you can literally cut it in half and, and uh, it, it works beautifully and they respond very nicely. A little bit better close up of that lower container, which I really enjoyed. And by the way, in the in two of those containers year round and they've been in it for three or four years is the um hakanakaloa grass now it is brownish in in winter but it still has presence and i take that brownish grass the dead grass away just before the new growth comes in the spring so you get a repetition of um, textures and colors from uh, the repetition using that variegated um, form um, in, in, in that particular one with the uh, spider plant, okay? Good. Okay, this was prime. Okay, I love uh, having some of the Mexican battery. It is not, not fired well enough to leave out over winter. You must bring this inside or you will lose it, okay? But I loved it here on my deck. 
elevated with uh, an attractive uh, trellis type thing. And that is that selenium, S-O-L-A-N-I-U-M, selenium variegatum. And you see how beautifully it vines there. And into the center of that, there's lobelia. Lobelia may or may not make it through the heat of the summer. There's some heat tolerant ones that I need to trial this year to see really how well are they going to do. But that was spectacular through most of the summer. And if the lobelia decides it doesn't like the heat, just take with your little trowel, cut it out and put something else in, okay? <laughs> now, another favorite that I love playing with are the um, colocasia. And this is the more unusual colocasia. There's gold, there's oh, different colors and different sizes. And, and we're just now beginning to get those in and they are delightful in large containers or in the ground. And to plant it up with these things was very satisfactory. There's the weeping begonia, there is the Tratus cantia. People in the past did call that wandering dew if you're not familiar with the term Tratus cantia. And the colors of that Tratus cantia is picked up by the color of the grass, the carrot grass. And uh, a couple of other really interesting plants that are underused is the Aracene, I-R-E-S-I-N-E. -E. And that's a tall plant. That's the one in the middle, actually, between the colocasia and the, and the lower containers that are beneath that. Also, I have used caladiums in here. This is a great place for caladiums. Caladiums will grow in a lot of sun, but wow, you really have to watch the watering when you do that. I prefer to shade them from the hottest of afternoon sun. And uh, they're wonderful in containers or in the ground as you wish. They're a little cold sensitive, so be careful with the, uh, the caladiums. And in the next picture, a close up, uh, you can see these things a little bit better. Actually in the center there, the smaller leaf that repeats the uh, larger leaf of the colocasia is the, um, Caladium, and, and that particular one, I'm trying to think, what is the name of it? It's so funny, a frog in a blender. <laughs> it's variegation is very spread, okay? Frog in a blender. I don't have that particular one, but we will have it a little bit later. It, it's unique, I really do like it, but I love caladiums, okay? And that's a close-up of that beautiful weeping begonia. And again, the Tratus cantia that is a wonderful cascading plant. It's just great. And there's actually some plectranthus in there also. And then the, this picture is obviously in the ground. And um, this is the teacup. This is not at my home, by the way. My home is nowhere near that tidy. No, not. Teacup. And it's called teacup because it holds water when it rains. And then when it gets all full, it literally spills it out. So it's very interesting. And you can see it's pretty big. It gets um, at least four feet tall. And they do this when they're kept moist because all of these caladiums like moisture and they like fertilizer too. So we're gonna come back here for a few minutes and talk about uh, some of the care of these and then we'll discuss a few prime plants also. Taking care, it's not just the purchase of beautiful plants and we, we like to feel very proud that we get in some magnificent plants and have a lot of varieties of plants, but taking care of them is, is the important thing because you made an investment. We've made an investment so that we can have those plants that you're looking for. But once you get them home, you have to protect your investment too. I like 
to plant in containers that are as large as you can have for those plants. Minimum of 18 inches wherever possible. 14, 16, 18 is acceptable if you can keep them properly watered. If you're gonna choose a smaller container, be sure that they're up close where that you can keep an eye on them, particularly in the hot sun, so that you can keep them watered well. Now, I go through this and it's going to be repetitive for some of you, but uh, somewhere in here, I've got what I need. Um, in the bottom of the containers, I always put a piece of landscape fabric over the holes. In the, and unless you're growing a water garden, you need holes in your containers. So this goes over those holes. It helps to keep the soil in and some of the little creepy crawlers out, which is pretty important too. And then I fill at least two thirds full with uh, a good potting soil. We have our own Maryfield potting soil, which has a polymer in it that helps, helps with the moisture, doesn't take care of watering, but it helps with it. It's not organic because it has a polymer in it. All right, there are those that are organic and the scoma makes a good one. So this is a good potting soil also, and it is organic. It does not have that. If I can erect this one, this is, in addition to those, this is one of my favorites, and they make several different types, but this is Fox Farm, and it's a very good potting soil. <laughs> so I fill my container, and then I sit the number of plants in it to figure out just where do I want them and how to arrange them. And then when you take these plants out of their containers, <laughs> there we go. I like to loosen those roots very carefully, not destroy the root ball, but be sure that they're no longer growing around in circles, but will go out into the soil. Now, some people are concerned when you pull this out and there are a lot of roots. That's when I literally cut those roots. If it's strong roots, and you can do that with this too, okay? And, and then do this. These George chins come in handy. So that those roots stop growing around in circles and go out into the soil. And then plant it so that you barely cover the top of this with your potting soil. All right, I skipped something that's very important and that's fertilization in my opinion. I like to use um, organic whenever I possibly can and slow release, which a spoma makes wonderful products. There are others out there. This is the one I reach for most of the time. It's a spoma plant tone. It's all organic and it's slow release. I like to put, depending upon the size of the follow the directions, but I usually put a good heaping handful in a 16 inch container. Also out in the garden, they make one called garden tone. There's really not a great deal of difference in some of these. So I keep those two on hand pretty much and use them universally, but there's a rose tone and there's several others, okay? Now, how you continue with your fertilization, because you are growing in a container, you're watering it constantly. So you're leaching fertilizers out of that soil. It's different than when you're growing in the ground. They are going to need fertilization more often. So another good one, but it is not organic, um, is this, it's so easy to use though, the liquid bloom booster. 
and it's a nice uh, analysis on here. Follow your directions for this and, and use it to fertilize about every two weeks. You can do it weekly at half strength, and that's not a bad idea either. So this is complementing the other that you have. <coughs> if you're going organic, you can add more of the plantone, easily washing it in. Um, there are some other liquid ones. There's a fish oil that's good um, in liquid form that's organic. Uh, there's also, and I really want to try this one, it's called Tiger Bloom, and it's put out by uh, Foxglove, which is the same company that I showed you the potting soil, and they say it's really good. Fox runner, okay. Very, very good on that one. Now, I know that everybody, not everybody, thank goodness, a lot of people are like myself. They have more deer than they would really like to have. And so there's two different, you hand me that one on. And then there's also uh, liquid fence. Yeah, good. Okay, there are a number of organic um, liquid sprays on the market that help to repel the deer. Okay. I use primarily Bobbix because I got started with this and it has worked for me and is follow your directions, mix it according to the directions here. I use a pump sprayer because I have a lot of territory and a lot of plants that I have to cover. It doesn't wash off with the rain, but in the springtime, when you have rapid new growth, you do have to spray more often. And so for those things that I absolutely, my hosta, my day lilies, my oriental lilies are prime subjects for the deer. And so for a while, I'm gonna spray them every two or three weeks. In the summertime, once a month might be enough. But if you want some of these plants that the deer also want, um, this has been my solution, unless you've got a fence, okay? Now, there are other products on the market. A lot of people have had great success with liquid fence. So, you know, there's more than one. I, as I said, I've used Bobex consistently but I'm told that Liquid Fence does a very good job also. All right, let's go back to, I kind of got a little distracted. We're potting out this container. And I told you I need to use some plantone in there. It's amazing how quickly things respond. I put a tomato, a nice big tomato in a larger container in our annual house. And I added some of that plantone I did this like two weeks ago because I wanted to grow it on really and get it as big as I could to, to put it out in a container, warmer soil next week after this little cold is passed. Okay, so let's come back to that container for a minute. When you pot up your containers, don't put the soil all the way to the top of your container. Hold it down for a couple of inches. And then if you have squirrels or things that dig in your containers, I go out for three eighths inch stone and I prefer the, the red, the Seminole chips because it's irregular and scratches like the, the slugs don't like it as well. If you put a good half an inch of this on top of your soil after you've planted it up, it's much easier to water. The soil stays in the pot and it discourages the digging because the squirrels love fresh soil to dig in. Let me uh, hopefully take, I obviously am not gonna have a whole lot of questions. I'll hope to hold at least 10 minutes, Sally, but I want to say, yes, we do have impatience that now are resistant to the powdery mildew. So don't be afraid to go back to some of those wonderful impatience. There are a couple of different varieties out there. The one I have in my hand is called Beacon and, and they are resistant. There are many types of begonias out there. 
A favorite for all but the hottest afternoon sun is the dragon wing begonia. And I thought that this particular Avinca vine was really attractive. It's called Wojo's Gem, J-E-M. And that's a great one to cascade. But look how pretty this is with that impatience. And then there's a white Broelia over here. This one loves the shade. This will grow up taller, but those are very pretty. And, and white is a nice cool color too. So those are very attractive. I do want to show you up close because this irisine is not used enough. This is a baby and you can actually pinch the top out of this just, just above the new growth that's coming there and it will branch out nicely. But this will get two and a half, three feet tall and be such a compliment to, or the centerpiece of an arrangement, but it complemented that uh, colocasia, that big colocasia very well. So those are just a quick touch on some of the shade plants. I did bring up one hanging basket container because here again, there's a difference in these gorgeous, gorgeous double blooms. The only one that will take a lot of sunshine is selenium, S-O-L-A-N-I-U-M, selenium, okay? The others don't like the hot afternoon sun. They'll take dappled all day and they'll take full morning sun, but they don't like the hottest afternoon sun. Selenium will take the sun, okay? Yes, ma'am. Did you need me, Sally? I just wanted to confirm that was a begonia. It is a begonia. Yes, it is. And there's a lot of other beauties back here. Of course, you can't ignore the wonderful uh, supervels, the Calabrocoa. Wonderful. But I'm not going to have time to go through all of this, except I got to make this and then we'll go try to take some questions. And in containers, I grow a lot of herbs in containers. I grow tomatoes, I do squash in large containers. Container soil warms up before the soil planting tomatoes and, and peppers and some of those things that are sensitive to soil temperatures. You can do it sooner in containers because they warm up faster. But I love to have good herbs near the kitchen if possible. And, and wonderful lemon thyme and rosemary and parsley and chives. Those are my favorites, but they're wonderful in containers also. All right, Sally, let's let's take a few questions. All righty, um, just a reminder for everybody, if we are not able to get to your question today, um, you can hit reply on your confirmation email and send that question to us following class. I'll make sure Peg or another member of our team is able to address it for you because um, we do have a good number of people on this call today. Um, okay, our first question, can you discuss when you have containers, do you have any preferences in terms of materials for pots, um, especially for these summer containers? What do you prefer to use? I have a variety of pots I've accumulated way too many over the years and because of a desire to learn um, how things are, are going to do plus to do different combinations each year. Um, I have um, terracotta which I love. I always refer to it as a good black dress because terracotta will go with anything. So I love terracotta. And um, I do leave a number of them out over the winter and occasionally I will lose one because they, they're the ones that are fired well will, if they're kept up off the ground, they'll do pretty well, but you will lose one now and then. Their ceramics do well for me. And so far I've had them go through the winter quite well. As long as again, there's no saucer underneath and they're not on the ground. Uh, so that's fine. I try to combine them uh, according to color or texture or that sort of thing. 
So I also have some cement ones and hypertufa, which I will be doing one of the zooms coming up on the hypertufa containers, which are wonderfully interesting. Okay. So I done the plastics, of course, work fine too. The the containers that we just showed you are all plastic, okay? So I don't have a big preference. I just pretty much combine the colors that work well for me or the textures that work well for me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. I know they all have their own pros and cons. Um, we had someone ask when the Mexican pottery was showing if um, basically what containers would be good going through the winter. So I think you probably- that Definitely, I want to- that Right. And I'm pretty sure this one is a, is a no, but uh, there are others. So, um, alrighty, let's see here. Uh, can you confirm, is Gartenmeister fuchsia, is that a type of salvia? Or are they related? No, it's not a salvia. Okay. It's okay. the fuchsia family, okay? And okay. they are fantastic plants. That's okay. Good to know. I actually wasn't sure when she sent that question and I didn't know. Um, is there a native salvia option if you want to try and plant native? You know, I would have to look that one up myself. Okay. Yeah. Feel free to, yeah, feel free to send us that one. We'll follow up with you um, on any there are good ones. Uh, okay. Next question. Um, can any of these plants be left outside during the winter and survive, or do you need to move all of these containers into a protected area during the winter? How do you manage that? Well, a few of the ones that I mentioned that were perennial, uh, the Carex grasses, the um, Hakanakloa grass uh, were a few of those. When you know that they're perennial, will we'll usually live over in the containers. Most of the ones that I mentioned are totally annuals. And uh, for the most part, you just kiss them goodbye or perhaps take cuttings of them and carry them over inside. But basically most of the things that I talked about are annuals that do not live over the winter. Okay, all right, that's good to know. Um, if someone's interested in trying some of these plants that you've discussed in their, in their garden beds rather than in a container, would you prepare the soil in a similar way to the way you prepare it for a container or would you do something different? In your soil, depending upon what it's like, you know, does it drain well? Um, is it solid clay? Do you need to add some and work in some leaf grow or something that you would work into the soil? You don't necessarily have to put potting soil in there. I would tend to use leaf grow to break it up or a planting mix to break it up and work it thoroughly into the soil and then do your planting. And all of these plants will do well planted in the soil outside, okay? We were just talking about containers today, but they also will work in the soil. Okay. Um, all right, next question. Oh, this addresses the weather now, which is good that this was brought up. Um, with the chilly weather that we're having right now, can I plant my Gardenmeister fuchsia now or should I wait? If you are planting in a container, the, the, the soil is warmer than if you were planting in the ground. However, it's going to be cool two more nights. And looking at the forecast in the future, I usually think of the 26th or the 27th as our last kind of frost to date possible. And that varies tremendously. But usually, usually we do not have frost going into May. And so I feel fairly safe. In fact, on Sunday, I probably will begin to pot up some of my containers. Now, having said that, I like to have on hand, whether I'm putting them in the ground or putting them in containers, hopefully we're past this cold, coldest night temperatures and potential frost. I like to have on hand, and I did not bring it up here with me today, but I have in the past, that frost cloth. It's very thin and flimsy, and the water goes through and the light goes through, and I either staple it down if it's out in the garden, I staple it down with the sod pins, or if it's in a container, loosely put it over your container and tie it off with a string. 
that will, in most instances, take care. And you can leave it on for several days if you want to. In fact, out in the vegetable garden, you can leave it on indefinitely. A lot of people use it to ward off the squash bugs and, and bean beetles and that sort of thing. So that is, that's a good investment to make in some of that because you use it over and over again. All right, great. Um, okay, ooh, next question. Can you recommend a geranium that will take sun all day, including hot afternoon sun? Geranium, a lot of the geraniums, the regular geraniums, not the ivy geraniums, but the regular geraniums, is promoted to be able to take the hot afternoon sun. Now, if you've got a deck where you just get blistering hot afternoon sun, uh, I think it may talk back to you a little bit in August, you know, but uh, maybe, maybe you could plant something with it that would shelter it somewhat. Maybe if you've got an umbrella on your deck, you might, put it under the edge of that in the hottest afternoon sun, but they, are, they are, are supposed to take the hot afternoon sun. Okay. Is that a non-answer? <laughs> uh, that's good, that's good. Um, all right, next question. These two questions kind of go together. I'm looking at them trying to figure out because they're very similar, um, but a little bit different. So the first question is how often do you repot your containers? And then the second question that I, I would say is pretty related is, if you have a very large pot, do you need to remove all the soil from the previous season before putting new plants in your container or can you use the old soil? That's, so, a, very, kind of that's a very good question. What's your philosophy of repotting? How do you do it? When? Well, with, with the repotting, no, I don't replace all of the soil every year. However, and this is why I love these really substantial um, trowels. Um, you need to go right down to the bottom and loosen that soil up because it compacts with the season and you want to open that soil up. You could certainly reuse it. I really like to, before I begin that, I like to scoop out about a third of that and I'll use it or work it into the garden or put it in another container that I'm going to plant up and then loosen that soil and add maybe one third of fresh soil each year. Otherwise it's fine. And of course I have a constant question with people, I've got a large container or a deep container. What do I do to fill this? And I know that there are a lot of people, they're concerned about the weight of it, number one, but uh, I have a little, I'm always calling it a truck, Danny, why is it that always dolly? dolly. <laughs> I blank out on that word every time. A little dolly to help move those heavy containers around. I believe in filling that container with potting soil. I really do. You'd be shocked how deep these roots go and how much better they grow when they have that soil to grow in. Now, there are people that want to put Coke cans or something in the bottom. If you do that, I would suggest that you put that landscape fabric over your holes, put in the stuff, and then put another piece of landscape fabric on top of it. However, that's not what I do. I don't replace it unless it's a tomato. And you know, we're always told that they're more susceptible to blights, etc. when you grow a tomato in the same soil year after year. And so after you've done that for a couple of years, it's probably a good idea to replace that soil, clean out that container and start with fresh soil, but you can reuse it in some other container. And, and I think that the first part of the question that you asked first was, how often do I repot? Generally speaking, I don't repot if I planted this container up for the season, generally speaking, I don't repot. However, I planted actually more herbs in here than, than it really would like to have. However, with that, you're going to have the dill plant that isn't going to last all summer. It doesn't like the hottest. You, with dill, if you want to have it all the time, you have to keep it coming 
and keep fresh ones started. So you can take that out. If you chose to and you felt there was too much in your container, you can always deep and cut it out and lift it out with your trowel and pot it up in another container. But generally speaking, I don't change my containers once they're potted up and, and they're doing well. Okay, great. We have one more question, um, and then I know we're at one o'clock, so we'll right. give you a chance to wrap up. That trowel that you're holding, we always get a ton of questions about this. So I know that's a Wilcox All Pro. Do you know the handle length of that trowel? This particular one is, is at least 18 inches. Okay. okay, yeah, I know there's a few different ones. Yeah, um, there that, there's some smaller ones, and I'm really learning to use some of the smaller ones too now. This is a, a really good one. It's probably more 12, 12 plus, right? Does it tell you what it is? So this is the 14 inch All Pro Trial. 14 inch. One. This one's 14 inches. Okay. This one's probably. Ah, <laughs> Danny, you're just so good. And this is the, this is the 18 inch All Pro Long Handled Trial. Okay. Now we we at the moment are so so that was the broader one, but James out here is is trying to locate and get more of those in. Yes, we got a ton of questions about this, so that's definitely... Yeah, it's the best trial you'll ever run. <laughs> um, all righty. Well, I know we're at one o'clock, so I'm going to just say quickly, Peg, and then let you wrap up however you would like. Um, we have a plant clinic on vegetable gardens at 2 p.m. Danny, who has been in the background today, will be hosting that class. I will not be there, but I will be around until about two. So if you want to join that class and you haven't signed up, send me an email and I will send you the link to register. Um, we'll have a recording out tomorrow along with a plant list and a coupon. It'll probably go out more like tomorrow lunchtime-ish. Um, and Peg, is there anything you'd like to close with before we wrap up? Just wrapping up, of course, very cold sensitive basil, okay? But I love this. This is a variety that isn't grown very much. It's called Greek Globe, and it is very long lasting, so fragrant. And I also like to, I have enough basil to let them go to seed because, oh my, is that a wonderful draw for the little insects. Uh, the, the bees and, and different insects. And there's something people may not be aware of in the herbs section. We sell celery. I love this little plant. I've grown it now for several years and you can harvest it side pieces or use the leaves. It's just fantastic, celery. And within my herb garden, I love to always include marigolds and nasturtiums and maybe even some calendulas, all of which are edible if you like them. I'm not too fond of the flavor of the marigold, but I love it to uh, decorate all of the particularly salads. It's wonderful to garnish it with this and with the nasturtium and the calendulas. So those just skimming the surface of some of the plants that I enjoy growing and I hope you'll try. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much, Peg, as always. Um, thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon. And Danny and David, we'll see you all who are joining the next class at 2 p.m. Bye, everybody.